How are Matthew, Mark, and Luke related? Matthew, Mark, and Luke share a lot of similar stories and material, down to the very words between them. So who copied who? And did they violate copyright laws? I want to take a slightly different approach today, but still sort of the same. Instead of zooming in on one passage, what I'd like to do is zoom out and look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke as a whole, the three synoptic gospels. And don't worry if you're more of a circular thinker or a linear thinker, I've got you covered in this video. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels, and they've been called that since the early church. Why? Because they take a very similar approach to how they tell the story of Jesus' life. John, well, he's on another plane. He doesn't play well in the sandbox with the other kids. Almost 85% of John's gospel is completely unique to him. Now the word synoptic comes from the Latin synopticos, which is taken from the Greek synoptikos. The idea of the Greek word is to see the whole together or to have a comprehensive view. By calling them the synoptic gospels, it refers to the idea that these three see the life of Christ in a very similar manner. So if these three are related to each other, what type of relationship do they have? Are they kissing cousins or distant relatives? Welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. If you're new here, my name is David Paris, and for the past 20 to 30 years, I've been teaching seminary and other graduate level courses on New Testament studies, Greek, and linguistics. The goal of this chapter is to take what I've been teaching in those institutions, break the four walls of the classroom wide open, and make it available to anybody on YouTube. So if you like these videos, which take quite a bit of work, please give them a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share it. Let other people know about it, please. You can do that completely free, and I won't charge you anything at all for it. Thanks. Matthew, Mark, and Luke not only take a similar perspective on Christ's life, but they share a great deal of the same material or content. So let's do a little analysis here. If I draw Matthew, Mark, and Luke on the screen here, how much content do Matthew, Mark, and Luke have in common? I'm going to color in blue the areas that represent material that is shared by all three authors. Well, almost 76% of Mark's material is found in Matthew and Luke as well. By contrast, though, 45% of Matthew's gospel and 40% of Luke's gospel is shared with the other two. This shared content is what is referred to as the triple tradition. If we dive a bit deeper, we can see some other interesting patterns as well. What about the other 24% of Mark's gospel and over 50% of Matthew or Luke? If we break this down, we can see that 18% of Mark's gospel is found in Matthew's gospel as well, but not in Luke. This makes up only 10% of Matthew's gospel though, and we need to remember that Matthew and Luke are quite a bit longer than Mark, so they're going to have smaller percentages. What about stories that Mark and Luke have in common but are not found in Matthew? This is interesting because only 3% of Mark's gospel is shared with Luke but not with Matthew, and that only makes up 1% of Luke's gospel. That covers most of Mark's gospel, but there are still big chunks of Matthew and Luke's gospel that are unaccounted for. So do Matthew and Luke share content that is not found in Mark? Yes, and quite a bit. Matthew and Luke share almost 24% of their material between them. Teachings and stories that are not found in Mark. And we're gonna come back to this later on. Now, if you're fairly sharp with the old slide rule, you'll notice that these numbers don't total up to 100% for any of them. That's because 3% of Mark's gospel is unique to him. Stories that Matthew, Luke, or John do not contain. By contrast, 
20% of Matthew's gospel is unique to him. And I'm making this purple so you can see that. And a whopping 35% of Luke is unique to him. So how did we end up with these interesting configurations? Ever since the early church, scholars have speculated about the relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Augustine thought that Matthew was written first and Mark and Luke copied off him, mainly because Matthew is first in the Gospels and it also has these little markers like this was done to fulfill or it was written in the prophet. And for this reason, they thought Matthew was the most Hebrew and he quotes from the Old Testament. However, Matthew's Gospel is written in very good Greek, much better than Mark's. And it's difficult to explain grammatically how Mark would have been based on Matthew. Rather, it's better to see Matthew working off Mark and cleaning up his work and putting it in better Greek. Second, Mark's gospel is shorter and much more abridged than Matthew or Luke's. Once again, it's better to see Matthew and Luke working off Mark and then expanding and filling out his work. For example, Mark does not mention Jesus' birth or the post-resurrection stories. Two very important events that are both in Matthew and Luke, and it's difficult to explain why Mark would have admitted these stories in his account. All right, let's take a linear approach to illustrate the relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke this time. If you're wondering how we went from the disciples wandering around the countryside with Jesus to writing down the final form of the Gospels, check out the video that I did on that subject. And it's thundering and lightning outside, so hopefully I can get this video done. But I digress. Let's get back to the linear diagram. As I said, I'm working off the assumption that Mark was written first. This line here represents Mark's gospel, sort of from the beginning to the end. Within his gospels, we have a number of distinct stories and teachings that he has arranged to tell his account of Jesus' life. He opens his gospel with John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness, chapter 1, verses 2 through 11. Immediately after that, Jesus enters into Galilee and begins his ministry in chapter 1, verse 14. Two chapters later, he introduces the setting for the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus goes up on the mount, he appoints the 12 disciples. But it's interesting that Mark does not record the Sermon on the Mount. That's material that is found in Luke and Matthew, this shared material between them. Now, Matthew and Luke include most of Mark's material, but perhaps more importantly right now is that they follow his order. In literary studies, we would call Mark a hypotext. I know, a big word. But what a hypotext is, is that it means that Mark serves as the basis for Matthew and Luke that come after him. As a hypotext, Mark lays down the order for how the story is told by others. In this case, Mark's order of events serves as the skeleton for Matthew and Luke. This doesn't mean that Mark had free creative reign in how he organized his material. Jesus' ministry in Galilee would have naturally come very early, and his last week in Jerusalem and crucifixion naturally has to fall at the end. So certain events are fixed in order. But others, let's say Jesus healing or interacting with someone, Mark is going to have a lot more flexibility as to where he includes that in his gospel. If Mark has the stories, and we'll just call them numbers right now, what's interesting is that Matthew and Luke follow Mark's order. There's a few exceptions, but basically they follow his order. This order of events then serves as the backbone for Matthew and Luke's gospel, into which they're going to insert other material. For example, Matthew and Luke both include stories of Jesus' birth that are not included in Mark's Gospel. Let's take a look at one example story that Matthew and Luke share in common. Matthew 3, 7 through 10 and Luke 7 through 9. This is the well-known story where John the Baptist rebukes the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You brood of vipers. Now, don't worry about reading the full text here. Rather, I'm going to color the text so you can see the parallels between Luke and Matthew. First, notice that their introductions are quite different. But when we get to the actual quote of Jesus here, it is almost verbatim. Almost 70 words are shared in exact order, word for word. 
There's only one word difference in the NRSV translation. Matthew has presume, Luke has begin. And if I switch to the Greek text, you can see that the words presume and begin are based off two different Greek words. The NRSV did a great job at preserving the parallel between these two texts. Luke also includes a third word, chi, that's different. It means and, also, but, even. And in this particular context, it really doesn't need translation into the English. That's why they don't have it in the NRSV's version of Luke. So what was the shared source material that both Matthew and Luke used? Since the time of the early church, scholars have debated whether this source was written down or a collection of memorized teachings. Once again, we have a highly technical term for this, Q. Q comes from the German quella, which means source. And there's a couple of defining traits that are common to this Q material. First, it is primarily made up of sayings or teachings, no actions. Second, this material does not include locations or settings. This is why Matthew's introduction and Luke's introduction are so different in this instance. Third, because of these two traits, when Matthew and Luke use Q material, they have a lot more freedom and flexibility about where to include it. For example, in the three temptations, only Matthew and Luke include the dialogues between Jesus and the devil. Mark just introduces the temptation, he's out there for 40 days, and then he has the very end when angels come to minister to him. Matthew and Luke include the three dialogues or interactions with the devil. As a side note, this is perhaps one of the few instances of Q material where actions or locations are included as well. I know I picked a bad example here. In Matthew, the order of the temptations is, turn this stone into bread, throw yourself down from the temple, worship me and I will give you all the nations of the world. Lots of information here, I need to keep the throat lubricated. Now Luke has a different order. He starts just like Matthew does with turn this stone into bread. Then he jumps to worship me, I will give you all the nations of the world and concludes with throw yourself down from the temple. So why do they have a different order to the temptations? Matthew's gospel opens with the Gentile Magi coming to worship Jesus. And it concludes with Jesus's command to go and make disciples of all the nations. So, by having worshiped me, and I will give you all the nations of the world as the final temptation, it fits Matthew's overall focus that the good news of Jesus is for all the nations of the world. Luke, on the other hand, gives special interest to Jerusalem and the temple in his Gospels. He opens his Gospel with Zacharias serving in the temple, and then the second chapter of Acts focuses on the Holy Spirit and the first sermon by the disciples in the temple. So by placing the temptation to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple as the concluding temptation, it matches his theological interest in Jerusalem and the temple. Oh, look, a squirrel. No, actually, how about, oh, look, the Gospel of Thomas. Let's take a little sidetrack at this point. I mentioned how throughout church history, scholars have debated if Q was a written or an oral source. And there are good arguments for both sides. If it was written down, they argued it would just be a collection of Jesus' teachings, no actions, and no setting for where these teachings were originally uttered. In 1945, archaeologists were digging around Nag Hammadi in Egypt, and they came across a collection of books in the desert there that have come to be known as the Nag Hammadi Library. Among them was the Gospel of Thomas. Now here's the interesting thing about the Gospel of Thomas. This short manuscript is a collection of Jesus' sayings, no actions, no setting. The Gospel of Thomas is not the Q source. It is very different from the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament Gospels. And we know that the early church fathers rejected and criticized this document. So why is Thomas so important? because here we have a document that is almost exactly like what the church had speculated Q would be like if it was written down. It really gives a great deal of credence to the argument that Q was a written source and that these speculations are pretty valid because here's a document that fits that same style and structure. 
Well, you're wondering if all this is like decaf coffee. It just doesn't get you where you want to go. Well, no, this is actually pretty caffeinated. When we study the Gospels, we need to let each author speak for themselves. Even though Matthew, Mark, and Luke take a similar approach, they are also very different. And you can see that in the circle charts that I drew earlier. Each author wanted to teach their churches something, and they took a different theological agenda to do that. So don't try to make them all say the same thing. Also, don't jump from one story and one gospel to the other to prove your point. A story in Matthew could be making a very different point than its parallel in Mark or Luke. Second, just because they have a different order of events does not mean they made mistakes or made stuff up. Rather, they ordered their material for a particular reason. What are they trying to teach you through the order of their gospel? For example, two weeks ago in the video on Luke, I talked about how from Luke 9 to chapter 19, Luke has Jesus on his journey from Jerusalem. He has set his face to Jerusalem. Matthew, on the other hand, organizes his gospel around five distinct cycles. Jesus' teachings, and then followed by a couple of chapters on his doing miracles to show that Jesus is mighty in word and deed. But you can see how Matthew and Luke have structured their gospels in very, very different ways. These differences, additions, omissions, and changes in order are not proof for or against the historical accuracy of their account. Rather, it reveals these authors' style, selection, and theological emphasis and argument. Let's take a moment and just consider how this coheres with the idea of inspiration. Inspiration does not mean that the accounts of Jesus were suddenly revealed to authors one night and then they wrote it down. Rather, it also includes the idea that Matthew and Mark were probably witnesses to Jesus' life, and Luke tells us that he went back and spoke to the eyewitnesses. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were also leaders and teachers within the early church, and God used these experiences and connections with others in the production of their gospel accounts. At the same time, we see how they have the freedom to admit, include, edit, or highlight this material to communicate their theological teachings and understanding of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Think of it this way. If you watch a live telecast of a sporting event, say, the Tour de France, you'll see it play out as it actually takes place over in France. This is one way to look at the Gospels, that's sort of like a live telecast of Jesus' life. But taking this approach gets you into all kinds of trouble, especially when they omit or they change the order of events. Rather, think of the Gospels as a post-race wrap-up show when the commentators come on the stage and look back over the race and explain when, where, and why key events took place in the race and why that person won the race. One commentator might think that the key move took place during a sprint through a small town. Their co-commentator might argue then that no, the turning point of the race really occurred at the top of a particular mountain. What these commentators bring to our understanding of that race is that they have been participating in bike racing and commentating on it for years. Some are even former pro racers themselves. So they help us to see and understand aspects of the race that we would have never picked up on. Just like the evangelists, they are professional Christian leaders who have been in the race for years. Second, these race commentators might jump around to illustrate their points. This is the advantage that commentating on the race after it is over has. The same with the Gospels. The authors want to teach us about Jesus' life after the fact, and they pull from this rich treasury of material on Jesus' life, both oral, eyewitness, and written down accounts to compose their Gospels. The New Testament scholar Grant Osborne wrote, that understanding how Matthew, Mark, and Luke are related to each other enables us to rediscover the evangelists as inspired authors and to understand their books for the first time as truly gospels, not just biographical accounts, but history with a message. They did not merely chronicle events, but interpreted them and produced historical sermons.
Finally, all of this calls us to be better and more careful readers of the Gospels, a challenge that we need to seriously take up. In future videos, I hope to actually dive into texts where I can compare, for example, Luke's account, which the lectionary is going through this year, with Matthew or Mark's accounts as well. So we can kind of zoom in and actually see word for word differences or parallels between these and how that shapes their particular message. Until then, peace.